She's talking today about Taiga, a dark forest for composable private applications. Take it away. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about Taiga. And first of all, I'm going to introduce you to the Taiga team. It's like all people working on making Taiga. It's Simone, Alberto, Joe, Shuyang, me, and Vasily uh, in the dark forest, of course. So, now back to Taiga. Uh, first of all, what problems Taiga solves? So, there are some uh, projects that uh, provide counterparty discovery, and oh god. <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I see. Yeah, so, no. Okay. Yes? Yes, yes. So there are projects that provide counter <coughs> party discovery and atomic matches like OpenSea. So like users can find other users to um, transact. And there are projects that provide shielded state transitions like Zexi. So you can do arbitrary state transitions, but privately. And Taiga kind of is, uh, all good? No? Okay, I'll just continue talking. Uh, and Taiga is kind of in the intersection of these projects, but also on top of that, Taiga provides private account abstraction. It might sound like complicated, but private account abstraction basically means that users can choose how to authorize their transactions, uh, like signature or whatever they want. They can specify it. So for people who are familiar with Anoma, what is the relationship between Taiga and Anoma? Well, Taiga is a privacy preserving part of Anoma that takes care of shielded state transitions. But it also can be used as a standalone component with uh, separate uh, storage. And uh, Taiga overview. This is like the, the word is slide of the presentation. So, but like, it's not going to be like that. But if you need like one slide overview what Taiga is, it's this. Uh, so uh, starting from the first point, it's an operating system for distributed applications as the talk description says. So it means that uh, users of Taiga can build applications on top of Taiga, and Taiga makes sure they uh, work correctly, as they should, just like normal operating system has applications. Uh, Taiga is shielded, meaning that it provides both data and function privacy. Uh, yeah, private account abstraction, as I mentioned, is that users define their own rules. And as many other privacy preserving projects, it's UTXO based. So every transaction on Tiger is a list of input and output notes. So notes will be like an important thing in this talk. And Tiger also uses the notion of validity predicates, which are basically declarative smart contracts. So in a more like well-known smart contracts, you just write down what to do and uh, it just executes, right? And in uh, validity predicates, uh, you describe the final state transition or the properties it should have, and Taiga um, makes sure that they're satisfied and doesn't really care how it's done. So like on the picture, you can see like uh, food style comparison of these uh, paradigms. Um, Taiga provides atomic state transitions of arbitrary complexity. Sounds complicated, but I'm going to talk about that some more later. And it also has uh, intense centricity, so it's built around intents, which are user preferences. Users describe what they want, and Taiga tries to make sure their intents are satisfied with the help of counterparty discovery layer, so matching intents is taken care of. So this uh, big slide is done, and now the map of the rest of the talk. So there will be three like main sections. First one is what are Taiga applications. Next one is how to achieve atomic state transitions. And the next is uh, how Taiga achieves data and function privacy. First one, Taiga applications, very short one. So there is a shielded pool of nodes, like UTX model, right? And all of these nodes like uh, floating around there. And uh, applications are basically the things that tell users what is allowed to do with these nodes and what is not allowed. So 
An application contains two main parts. It's application state and application logic. Application state is built from all of the nodes the application uh, owns. And application logic is expressed as a validator predicate. So basically, you can say that validity predicate uh, of the application defines the application. So application, it's a state, and logic, right? Now talking about atomic state transitions of arbitrary complexity. Uh, in case you don't know what does it mean uh, to be atomic, so many systems, when they want to provide uh, transactions of arbitrary complexity, they can't really achieve it in one transaction. So there are like many, many transactions. There is a sequence of transactions to achieve a certain state. And this is not like super good because uh, the system can like end up in the intermediate state if something goes bad. And like, we don't want that. So in Taiga, we make sure that um, there is just one transaction that takes uh, the state to the desired one. And uh, if something goes bad, it stays in the initial state. So like the worst case scenario is that nothing changes. So here's the recipe for atomic state transitions. It takes three components, partial transactions, intent application, and solvers. But you don't know what it is right now, so I'm going to explain. Partial transactions. Well, first of all, what is a valid Tiger transaction like a normal one? It has to satisfy two properties. First is that validity predicates of all uh, involved applications are satisfied. What does it make an application to be involved? Is that if transaction tries to change the node that belongs to an application, application needs to approve it. So we need to make sure that all changes are authorized by validity predicates of these applications. And the second one is that transaction needs to be balanced, which means that, um, well, all nodes, they carry some numeric value. In some applications, it can be more natural, like, uh, you know, cryptocurrency application, uh, just value like five ether is like just five ether, right? But in some applications, it can be more abstract, but all nodes have value. And uh, a balanced transaction is a transaction is when yeah, is a transaction when uh, for each application type the total value of input nodes equals the total amount, uh, value of output nodes. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I'm just omitting the uh, details here. It's not that important. And yeah, so valid transaction, valid predicates are ba uh, satisfied and it's balanced. And such transaction can be published on the blockchain. Uh, so a partial transaction is uh, just a normal transaction, but it's not balanced. And because it's not balanced, it cannot be published on the blockchain. But validity predicates must be satisfied, right? So the uh, quick idea of what we want to achieve is that we want to combine uh, partial transactions together until uh, their total value is uh, balanced and uh, then we can publish it on the blockchain as a single transaction. So you can see on the slide that there are two partial transactions. Uh, both have uh, validity predicates satisfied, but they're not balanced in the gray application type. But if we combine them together, it's all balanced and everything is nice. But we don't know how to do that yet. So the next one is the intent application. Intent application is just an application uh, that uh, works in a certain way, right? So uh, the user who wants uh, the intent to be satisfied, uh, they send the intent to the intent uh, gossip network and they add an intent application node to their intent. And while this intent node exists, uh, the transaction cannot be balanced because the amount of input nodes of this application doesn't match the amount of output nodes. We created this node, but not destroyed, right? So in the next step, Alice, here it's Alice, receives what she wanted, and she can destroy uh, her intent node. And uh, her part of the transaction is balanced. And once all of the users in this transaction uh, destroy their intent nodes, 
uh, the transaction is balanced and can be published on the blockchain. So basically, intent application makes sure that the transaction is not balanced until uh, the intent is satisfied. And the last, uh, the last thing in the recipe is solvers. And solvers are basically the actors who make everything possible. They uh, build transactions, receive intents, and merge them together. Uh, so, to create atomic transaction of arbitrary complexity solvers, uh, when they receive uh, partial transactions and partial transaction sets, what I call is like not really official name, they combine them together and update these sets of partial transactions until it's all balanced. And once it's balanced, they can publish it. So, like to summarize, three things: partial transactions, intent application solvers. Partial transactions cannot be uh, published on the blockchain. Intent application makes sure that uh, transactions are partial as long as the intent is not satisfied. And solvers try to update this transaction until it's satisfied. So altogether it allows to create atomic uh, state transitions of arbitrary complexity. Um, yeah, here is the example of it. It might look a little bit scary, but it's not. I promise. Um, so it's going to be a three-party barter. What I mean by three-party barter is like uh, when there are three users that want to get something and they have something, but they can't really satisfy like one, one of the others. So they need to kind of be combined in a cycle. They don't know about that yet, obviously. They just publish their intents and want them to be satisfied. So in the first step, every user, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they create their first partial transactions. And they also create intent nodes. Intent nodes are marked like gray notes with a colorful bottom. So you can see balances per each partial transaction on this slide because these transactions are not in the same set yet. So you can see it's not balanced, right? Then these partial transactions go to the first solver. The first solver receives only two of them so far and sees that, well, Alice wants a dolphin and Bob has a dolphin. So the solver naturally decides to give the Bob, uh, Bob's dolphin to Alice. And because Alice's intent is satisfied, uh, they can uh, spend Alice's intent note. This transaction, like the, the total balance of this uh, partial transaction set is not uh, zero, so it needs to be uh, solved further. So this uh, goes to the next solver, and next solver also receives the Charlie's partial transaction, and the solver sees that Charlie wants a star, and Alice had a star, so the solver sends this star to, uh, to Charlie, and the same way uh, Bob had, uh, what? Bob wanted a tree, and uh, Charlie had a tree, so the solver sends tree to Bob. And because everyone is satisfied here, all intent uh, nodes are spent. Yeah, I'm just like a note. I'm, I'm saying spent, but like um, destroyed is, and spent is kind of the same thing. We can't really destroy a node, but we kind of mark it as destroyed because it can't be used anymore. So yeah, uh, just to avoid confusion, sorry. So at this point, yeah, everyone uh, is satisfied and the transaction can be published on the blockchain. So the final transaction contains this like three-party barter and the intent nodes are also kind of being created and spent. Uh, not like non-existent, right? So that was the example of what I'm talking about, atomic state transitions. Uh, and the last part is uh, the privacy in Taiga. Uh, so I tried to create like a sketchy table of what we do and how we do it. So we achieve both data and function privacy. And uh, I divided data here into nodes and like transaction data. So nodes means basically the node content, like uh, the value, the application type, all of these things. Uh, we keep nodes encrypted. We use verifiable encryption to make sure that they're decryptable. And uh, to establish the existence of the nodes, we use node commitments. So like uh, we publish node commitments and people know that some node just started to exist. And for transaction data, like what exact nodes are being transferred or like uh, created, destroyed, right? Who participates in a transaction, the amount of nodes and the values, the applications. Uh, for that, we use zero knowledge proofs. 
to uh, to prove that state transition was correct without the re uh, revealing the state transition, and also hashes and blinding and other uh, stuff like that to kind of keep everything private. And for function privacy, which uh, refers to validity predicates, because validity predicates, they represent application function, right? And we wanted to keep private, so we need to hide them somehow. So we use zero knowledge proof recursion for that. So um, basically, the proof of a validity predicate is hidden inside another proof. So like uh, the outer verifier can't really know uh, what's inside the validity predicate. Uh, the proven system we use is Halo 2, uh, the one that is built by Zcash. And uh, we considered many uh, proven systems, like Plonk-based and many uh, polynomial commitment schemes. Uh, but we s decided to use Halo 2 because like, it uh, has some nice features. It supports recursion and accumulation. And for us, recursion is like important. Um, and uh, has some helpful gadgets available, like elliptic curve operations or some hashes that we want to use. And a nice feature of it is that it uh, doesn't have trusted setup. So like when you have a lot of circuits, uh, it's kind of like cool feature for us. Uh, so the current stage of Tiger is that there are still uh, many details to be um, confirmed. So uh, the details might be like not decided on yet, but they, I would say the design is pretty solid right now. So if you want to check it and check how we use Halo 2 and check uh, how we do everything, you can go to the uh, repo and check it, github.com slash anomalous slash Tiger. And the future of Tiger uh, is bright. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, eventually, I think we are planning to unify all of the execution environments, uh, public environment, shielded environment, and private into a single one, um, which is like uh, long-term plans, right? Because like fully homomorphic encryption, uh, complicated. And uh, we probably also want to have a closer integration with Fairview, which is another product we're developing. Um, so we could prove correspondence between private state and uh, the data encrypted to Fairview using zero knowledge proofs. So basically, Fairview is for like encrypting transactions so that you couldn't order them like in a sneaky way and just like not be biased, right? So if we could prove correspondence between private state that is like fully homomorphic encryption and data uh, encrypted to Fairview, it could be cool, right? Uh, right. Uh, so that's uh, basically it. Uh, thanks for listening. And if you have questions or you want to send me an email, uh, send me an email. Or if you want to, I don't know, talk, talk to me. So yeah, <laughs> I'm open to discussions. Thanks. I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we can take one or two short questions. Anyone? Yep. Oh, questions. Hello. Um, Hello. So you mentioned yeah. um, intent application, intent nodes. You said uh, solvers checking whether an intent was satisfied. And uh, you said something else again. Uh, but all this, my question is simple. What is an intent? Oh, yeah. Well, In very simple terms. Intent. Uh, in, on like technical level, it's a validity predicate. On less technical level, abstract level, it's just a, a way to describe for user its preferences. So like, you know, I want a car, this is my intent. Like, you want a Bitcoin, it's your intent. I write it down in the form of a validity predicate. Sorry, I, I was not talking into a mic, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So you, you briefly mentioned that um, partial transactions aren't balanced and that you have values attached to uh, inputs and outputs. Are those scalars or is that a more complex structure? What, what, what is a value in that context? Yeah, values are scalars. Okay, thank you. 
Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, are intents uh, encrypted? And if they are encrypted, how do the solvers know if it's balanced? Is there like some, some homomorphic encryption at play or how does it work? It's a good question, uh, but I might, like there is a chance I heard it in incorrectly. So like the question is intents are encrypted or not, right? Yeah, yeah so intents are encrypted, but because like uh, you can't really satisfy intents of the other person if you don't know what they want, you need to reveal this information to solvers. So you need, but you don't have to reveal it to everyone, but you need to give them some information to be able to satisfy your intent. So how do you selectively um, reveal your intent to the solvers? Well, you see, if like, it's like on a very abstract level. If my intent uh, to buy a car and I write it in the validator precode, I can tell a solver, I want to buy a car. And, uh, or just like uh, open the validator precode to them. It's like up to you how you do that, but they just need to know what exactly to do to satisfy your intent. Any other questions? So as, as far as I understand all this, like a lot, of, a lot of the kind of finality of it lies in the validity predicate, but it seems like a lot is kind of open for interpretation as to how you get there. And that applies to things like intents, but also like the private account abstraction you were talking about. Um, so I guess like a question would be like, what type of guide rails are there or limitations on how you can get to a valid validity predicate? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. It's yeah, we, like, we can chat afterwards as well. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a hard, I don't know how to ask it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Do the provers make any like intelligent choices about what intents they're trying to accumulate, or do they just accept any of the intents that get out there? It's up to the solvers. They like we don't specify that solvers can define like what they want, what they don't want. It makes sense for solvers to be like uh, kind of you know be related to some application. So for example, me as a solver only accept intents that are related to some, I don't know, uh, Sudoku application, like people who want to solve Sudoku or something, you know, something like that. Thank you. OK, last question. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I mean, don't want to get into the loop of encryption of intent and, and everything. We can keep on uh, speaking about it. but. Just, I think that's what we're here for, but just to understand who would be kind of your competitor or colleagues in the space, just to have a better kind of idea of, of what you guys are doing and how do you mainly differentiate yourself. Probably have missed it, but I think it's the, the great occasion to ask it here. Uh, just to check if I've understood it correctly, who are the competitors of a Tiger? Yeah, kind of, yeah, okay. of what you're doing, who kind of give the same value proposition and uh, yeah, how do you differentiate yourself? Well, um, hard to say, like, uh, let me open the slide quickly. Uh, <laughs> um, ah, okay. Yeah, so there are projects that uh, have private state transitions, which we also do. But uh, there are also projects that provide counterparty discovery. But I, as I know, there are no projects that combine these features. So like in that sense, Taiga is like different from them. But I would say it's pretty similar to Zexi in design. And like we also take a lot of inspiration from Zcash. So it's like, you know. Thank you. All right, I'd say let's wrap up this session. Let's thank Julia again.